Greetings and welcome to Creation in Crisis with a special welcome to friends and colleagues of Margie Abbott. Creation in Crisis is a monthly webinar sponsored by Creation Spirituality Communities that features speakers who are exploring the nexus between spirituality, cosmology, and activism. These three align with the three vocations of Creation Spirituality, mysticism, creativity, and transformation. Originally, this series was created to help us respond to the environmental crisis from a spiritual approach as people who hold the earth and all life sacred. Our speakers address this crisis in, in creation through their own experiences, through environmental law, earth activism, research, spiritual practice, science, cosmology, community organizing, and the arts. Your host for this session is our me, Gail Sophia Ransom, Penny Andrews, and our tech support is provided by Bob Eisenberger of Toronto. Thank Thanks, Gail. Just a couple of small logistical items before we get started. Um, uh, Margie's uh, presentation does include a couple of videos. At least one of those videos, the original sound is a bit low. So we suggest uh, that if you'd like to uh, increase the volume on your computer at your end, just to make sure you won't, you won't miss those. We'll also twice be going into breakout rooms. And um, uh, if you've not experienced those before, there's nothing uh, you need to worry about. I'll be managing that from, uh, from this end. Uh, it just gives us a chance to have some uh, small group conversations um, at Margie's prompts. And at the very end of the presentation, after the presentation is concluded, we've adopted a practice recently of providing some time for mingling, uh, which is simply a time to hang around and chat if you'd like, uh, to spend a couple of minutes perhaps with people that you don't get a chance to see very often because they're widely dispersed. Um, and so with that, and that's all I need to point out. Um, I'm gonna introduce uh, Penny Andrews, who's gonna introduce our speaker for the day, for the evening. Welcome everyone, it's great to see you here. Um, Margie has been coming to Creation in Crisis uh, sessions for some time now, and only this time did we realize she was waking up at 6 a.m. to do so. And so she is our very first guest to make such a lovely and generous sacrifice of her day to join us. Um, she is a, a friend that has come along since we've been part of the uh, Deep Time Network uh, year-long course, and it, she is a gift to us all. A sister of mercy, she has professional qualifications in education, adult education, pastoral ministry, and psychodrama. She's the author of four earth ritual books and is a keen organic gardener, hiker, and camper. It is a delight to welcome this month, Margie, to our, um, our 90 minutes together and welcome Margie. Thank you, Penny and Bob and Gail for the beautiful introduction to this morning. My morning, it is just six o'clock here. So I've been up since 5 a.m. preparing to be with you and I'm delighted to be here. And as we gather, we are linking both of our hemispheres. And in this moment, as we gather, we are one. And we're breathing together the gifts of Mother Earth so generously given minute by minute. And the electromagnetic waves that leave your body now are actually moving and connecting us all. It is quite a miracle that we can be together like this, so intertwined and entwined. And I would like, first of all, to acknowledge the First Nations people of Australia. It is our custom to always do this. 
when we are presenting and gathering. First Nations people of Australia had their land stolen and sovereignty was never ceded. I'm actually standing at this minute on Wadarong land in Geelong near Melbourne, Victoria, Australia. Every day I lament what has happened to the First Nations people. And I really ask you now, if you could take a moment to acknowledge your First Nations people wherever you are. Yesterday, I heard Steve in the cosmology course use some beautiful words that I thought really apply to us as we gather. We are travellers on a cosmic journey and we've just stopped for a moment in time to encounter one another. This is an invitation this morning to encounter one another and that's why I'm really keen for us to have a couple of small breakout rooms so that you can encounter one another and allow what is arising in you to be shared. Now, I do have a PowerPoint and, and, and as Bob has warned you, there is one um, video near the beginning, which uh, is a softly spoken Aboriginal First Nations woman, Miriam, who last year was the Elder Australian of the Year. And she teaches about dadiri, which is another word that means deep listening. So we will be able to follow her because she also has the words on the screen. So we'll now acknowledge that we are a group who's meeting together and encountering one another for a moment in time. Deep listening to the allurement of evolution in this time of crisis. Deep listening. To know me is to breathe with me. To breathe with me is to listen deeply. To listen deeply is to connect. It's a sound, the sound of deep calling to deep. Dadidi, the deep inner spring inside us. We call on it and it calls on us. We 
we are river people. We cannot hurry the river. We need to move with the current and understand its ways. We wait for the rain to fill our rivers and water our thirsty earth. for rebirth is now. If our culture is alive and strong and respected, it will grow. It will not die and our spirit will not die. I believe that the spirit of that day will have will blossom and grow. Not just within ourselves, but in our whole nation. The time for rebirth is now, says Miriam. And of course, you will all know what that means. Our, our earth needs us all to become awake and conscious that rebirth is critical. And so it is that I just take a moment to share with you very briefly a number of images from left to right, different plants that emerged in the evolutionary story over time, millions and millions of years ago for some of them, but also to the right, the ocean and the rocks, they were here first. And of course, the human was the last to arrive. So there is an invitation today to think about what are we awakening to? And what consciousness is being awakened in us and developed? If the universe is creativity itself, Try to get rid of this. How can we learn from the universe in terms of our own creativity? One of the most powerful forms of creativity is allurement. And this shows up in a spectacular way with the birth of a star. Just imagine if you were a hydrogen atom in a great cloud or a helium atom, one of these two, you're just there in this cloud and suddenly you're drawn towards other atoms. So we, uh, we call this gravitation, but really, even though we know a lot about gravitation, that is just a name for a power of attraction that pervades the universe. If you're a hydrogen atom, you have no understanding as to why you're being attracted. It, you simply are. And by releasing yourself into this attraction, you enter into a process of creativity. You encounter other atoms, you begin to heat up and even see what you thought of as your life break down. The very order of the hydrogen atom and of the helium atom breaks down and they enter into this fiery furnace that gives rise to something new the fusion interactions at the core of a star. So even though the hydrogen and the helium had no idea what was drawing them, there was an actual meaning to the whole process, the birth of a star. 
You know, in dynamical systems theory, we talk about the idea of an attractor. So the star, the, the future star, is an attractor operating on the cloud itself. So it is what is drawing the hydrogen and the helium forward. Now, how does that pertain to us? Well, if we can identify those, those ideas or those projects, those visions that attract us deeply, we can also realize as we think about them, we don't exactly know why. We might have ideas, but the very existence of this allurement is something that is primal. It's just in the universe. People are attracted to different things. But this, in, the, in terms of the universe's creativity, this can be seen as, as the future calling to you in the present. This allurement then, it's, it's the only way in which your future creative work can announce itself in the present. So the, in this sense, one's passions, one's allurements have to be considered sacred and they have to be cherished. They have to be protected so that they're not snuffed out. They're not degraded by uh, someone who doesn't understand. They, in fact, they have to be nurtured so they can allow to grow and occupy our life entirely. Because in the pursuit of these allurements, of the deepest allurement that we know, in this pursuit, we are being taken on a trajectory that is leading us right to our creative work. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a symphony, a song, a mathematical theorem, a new educational system, that future work operates in the present, in the allurement we feel at the very core of our existence. There is a creative impulse in each of us and there is a creative impulse in the universe that attracts us, that draws us, that inspires us. Let's just become really aware of what this means for us in the here and now. I'm, I'm coming up with this little cheeky comment. How come? How come? How come that we're all here together? How come you choose and I choose to be together with you? But what about some of these ones I've been thinking about lately? How come my little eight-year-old nephew, my great nephew, can talk about eukaryotes and prokaryotes and mitochondria and know what they mean, 
And guess what? I was 68 before I knew anything about any of them. And I say to myself, how come in 1995 in Portland, Oregon, Jean Houston sent all of us outside at a mystery school to lean up against a tree and wait for a message? I didn't have a clue what that meant then. And the message that I got was to ignite sparks of reconciliation and compassion, which later became the name of one of my books. But I had no idea that that tree had an interiority, that it had a right to live, that it was growing, communicating and loving. I had no idea then. So how come we evolve like we do. I was thinking about a Drew Dellinger poem that um, I read many years ago, back in 2008, in this book, which was called Original Blessing, Originally Blessed 25 Years of Creation Centered Spirituality. And I had, again, no idea when Drew was talking about ancestors that actually it was just this year in 2022 that Cliff Berrien stirred up my incredible being with these words, we are all descendants of the first ancestor. Our first ancestor is that African woman probably, probably a million years ago who gave birth to the first human baby. My goodness, how come? And I guess another one of my how comes is learning about the titanium that's in an elbow of mine that got broken once, that this is on the periodic table, that the elements in our body do remind us on a daily basis that we are of the 13.8 billion year history of the universe. How come? So just another example of how come before we go to breakouts. Um, how come I read and am reading, just to name a few, Tayard, Matthew Fox, Brian Swim, Thomas Berry, Meister Eckhart, feminist theologians, liberation theologians, Joseph Campbell and David Suzuki, to name just a few. How come I was so rapt when I first met Original Blessing and so rapt when I were, were read The Sacred Balance with David Suzuki and back in the mid-90s was part of a guy, a dreaming camp, to bring his book into real everyday experience? How come? How come I've studied cosmology and am studying it? To do a theology master's, to do psychodrama, pastoral ministry, spirituality, goddess spirituality, education, integral ecology. How come, how come we study what we study? And most recently, Sally Neves and I are doing a lot of work thinking about regeneration. And how come the experience, like in my early 20s, I did my first encounter group, many Jean Houston mystery schools, many retreats, circle dance, artist meditation, sweat lodges at least three times, deep time leadership cosmology, ancient postures workshops. All of these have evolved over time as I follow my allurements. So just another moment of reflection. What have you studied, read or experienced that inspires you in this precious present moment now? And my last example of the growing consciousness and evolution, uh, I would like to offer a Beatrice Bruto quote um, that to me says it all. 
In our meditations on the future and on our own growth into that future, we have come to realize that we are evolutionary beings and that what is actively evolving at present is our own very consciousness, including consciousness of ourselves as evolving. So just to give an example from of this evolution in my ritual books, um, in this first one, um, back in 1996, it was my first attempt to offer a ritual book to recover the sacred in all that is. But I only made one reference to the universe. Like I didn't know very much then about how to describe the 13.8 billion year story. So I'm suggesting that allurement and evolution are gradual. Then the next book, Sparks of the Cosmos, it gets a bit bolder and I say these are rituals for seasonal use, earth-based and include creation spirituality pathways, the four elements, four directions and the four seasons. But in my most recent book, I'm much bolder in announcing that I'm ready to think about igniting a re-enchantment with the sacred. And Sally Neves puts this beautifully. In order for us humans to grasp the enormity and implications of the universe story, we need constant reminders for the story to sink in. These rituals provide an opportunity for groups to express the sacred depths we encounter in earth community, to take up the challenges of our times in imaginative ways, and most importantly, to deal with the grief that may otherwise leave us frozen. So this is where we, it, we are going to have an invitation to move into, in, into breakouts for 10 minutes. And um, I'll just give you a few guidelines for this. So when you get in, for example, um, if you happen to be with um, four people that you don't know, just go around the circle quickly and introduce yourselves and say where you come from. And then make an intention to really deeply listen to one another and to what is arising. It's really important not to make this into a big discussion group. So just think about taking a minute or two each. And could you please share one allurement, one pathway that you have followed? I give a few examples here, like in your friendships, the study, creative endeavors, reading, encounters, whatever. If you could do that, and then when everyone shared once, and if there is time, you might have, you'll be able to share a second allurement. So thank you, Bob. I really appreciate you putting us into groups now. We'll just ask everyone to mute themselves again, please. All right, Margie, I think we're all back. Okay, thank you, Bob. So as we gather again in our larger group, just take a moment to become conscious of the fact that we are two hemispheres linked, breathing together, and that this is just the most wonderful opportunity for us to experience ourselves as one. We do have time for three or four people to share in the large group because when this happens in the large group, 
all of us are affected. All of us actually may go a little bit more deeply as we listen to one another. So if you do have something that you would like to share about your allurements in this evolutionary process, uh, you may like to put your hand up in the with the reaction button and uh, we'll take three or four responses. Thank you. If you click the raise hand button, that will make sure we can see you. There you go, Damien. You're muted, Damien. There you go. I think I'm unmuted. Yes. Um, we're our group in our small group that uh, what we have in common is after retirement, we have more time and also the maturity to devote ourselves to our spiritual interests and that we still have a lot to offer uh, in our personal growth to to one another and to society uh, as elders. I guess there's a recognition of spiritual a recognition and appreciation of spiritual elders. And that was the common theme in our group. Uh, what I'm wondering in the larger group, if there are other people besides my, myself, because the third part of my allurement since, since retirement years have been the multidimensional aspect of spirituality. That seems to have grown. Uh, and it started with me with the professional Michael Newton, a PhD psychologist doing afterlife and in between life therapy life regression therapy, and then the two uh, well-known uh, channelers and mediums, Lee Carroll and Susan Giesman. That's where my allurement has been the last three years. So I'm curious among the larger group, if there's also that allurement towards the multi-dimensional spirituality, even though our day-to-day -day human spirituality continues to be very important um, in our compassionate work, and it's part of contemplative spirituality, which is, has always been an interest of mine. But I'm just curious to know if other people are also allured by the multidimensional spirituality or the inter, it's also called the interdimensional spirituality. Thank you, Damien. Perhaps somebody uh, who wishes may like to put that um, in the chat to make a response to Damien, because that's a serious question and it deserves a response. Thank you. Okay, there are no other hands up. So let's let's continue um, with uh, the presentation. And uh, I look forward to seeing you on the other side of this presentation for another breakout. So Ken Wilber says that the adventure of awakening is one of the most universal of human dramas. All of us understand what that means physically when we awaken from a deep sleep or awaken from a deep dream. But there's also an awakening while we are physically fully awake when we move into those places where we are willing to listen deeply to what is emerging. And I just chose two or three little quotes to bring this out. I think the experience in human nature is really important to awakening. Um, the wisdom of nature can't be understood just with our thinking mind. It's we have to experience it with our being and let it speak through our senses. You know, as I'm standing here now, I'm very aware of these really beautiful desired tingling sensations in my feet because I don't have shoes on and I'm just standing here allowing them 
to move through my body to meet the electromagnetic waves. I'm experiencing being with you and I'm experiencing my own body as well. And Ken says, Ken Wilbur says, you cannot have exterior development without interior development. You all know that, but it's such a good thing to remember it. And then, of course, Gregory of Nyssa said back in the third, fourth century, how could anybody be so simple-minded as not to believe that the divine, however you experience the divine, is present in everything, pervading, embracing, and penetrating it. So now I'm going to move along a little to talk about some of the pain that exists in Earth at the minute. And one book I'm reading at the moment called Collapsing Consciously by Carolyn Baker just is so compelling. And I think if we could spend a moment reflecting on this quote. Had civilization not spent the last 5,000 years attempting to murder the indigenous self inherent in all humans, we would not have to be told that most of the time on the planet, life will be challenging, painful, scary, sad, and sometimes enraging. We've grown to become entitled to having everything work for us all of the time. The electrics, we want the car to work, we want the weather to work, but this has not been the case for millennia. And what the indigenous ancestors had to sustain them through the dark times was ritual and community, gathering, celebrating, loving one another, allowing the love to flow. And then Carolyn goes on to say, this is really important, I think, uh, particularly those of you who know Joanna Macy's work, which I love, but Carolyn says our moral, spiritual and human obligation is to now discard our positive attitude and start feeling the pain of humans and more than human inhabitants of Earth. Start feeling the pain in Ukraine. Start feeling the pain in the landslides in the pain, the pain of all that is happening in the world. And I just think that Carolyn has an amazing amount to share with us here in her book, Collapsing Consciously, Transformative Truths for Turbulent Times. But this week on Monday, the UN Secretary General talking about his response was so stark to the IPCC Working Group 3 report. This Monday and today for you is Thursday, I think, and for me it's Friday. But he says that some government and business leaders are saying one thing but doing another. Simply put, they are lying and the results will be catastrophic. I just think the next bit really deserves a minute of silence. Climate activists are sometimes depicted as dangerous radicals, but the truly dangerous radicals are the countries that are increasing the production of fossil fuels. It's moral and economic madness. Monday of this week, these words were spoken.
And so comes a very deep need for activism, to put our bodies, if we can, into places that can draw attention to this moral degradation. And we're going to go to breakout rooms again for 10 minutes. If each of you could take two minutes, and maybe somebody in the group would be willing to keep time on their device. But this is about listening deeply to the pain you feel about what is happening in Earth. You know, what is arising in you as you feel this grief? What is your allurement in evolutionary times? What is drawing you to act? So thank you, Bob, as you place us into groups. So I'll just ask everybody to mute themselves again, please. Uh, sorry to my group for exiting. <laughs> I think you're good, Marty. Okay, great. So are you going to continue recording, Bob? Um, uh, uh, we'll record until you're uh, finished. Uh, okay, great. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, we've got a few moments if anyone wishes to use the reaction button to put your hand up to share something of your experience. Um, it can be very simple and very brief. Thanks, Victoria. Hi, um, I was struck by how we're really all sharing the same items of grief. And I was just cut out of my group before I got to the punchline of what gives me hope, which is the, the quantum uh, flickering concept in quantum physics that's applied to biological systems that says when biological systems undergo excessive stress, they will flicker between the possibility, possibilities of utter collapse and a leap into a higher order of coherence biologically. And so my hope is that we're all, we're humans are biological systems within nature. I'm hoping that our consciousness can somehow flickers instead of collapsing with, you know, and producing the collapse of nature that we can leap into a quantum coherent higher order of biological organization in our own consciousness <laughs> and, and learn that we're not separate from anything and we can actually make a quantum leap and bring our, that consciousness into um, alignment with life and um, solve our problems from there. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thanks, Victoria. And also, I'm very aware that last time we met a month ago, Gail talked about the noosphere, the planetary mind, and there's something there, I think, to keep remembering that... Um, we are evolving in our consciousness and we can make a difference. Thank you, Winnie. Uh, yeah, in our group, after we each shared about uh, what grieves us and, and how we experience grief, we talked about how grief is, um, not, is collective. We tend to think of ourselves as being alone in our grief and we're not. Mm -hmm. uh, that grief is communal, it's collective. And, and there's, a, there's an energetic connection too. And even just like the four of us and together in our breakout, come together to talk about it, it changes the energy of it. Exactly. So grief is, grief is not individual, it's collective and shared. And that's where the hope yeah. is. Yes. Thank you, Winnie. Sarah, could you unmute, please? Yeah. You're muted, Sarah. There. Okay. Um, down here in the lower Rio Grande Valley in Texas, I have been feeling rather alone. And this, this is a miracle. This happened because I just came home from a day of painful physical therapy for all my joints. And, and this popped up on my computer that I had signed up and um, I planted the pomegranate and then I came in and this happened. I can hardly breathe. Yeah. So it's a miracle. And then I heard Mabel St. Louis from the Sisters of St. Joseph in Canada, and I attended a little college to retool to teach K through 12 for several years after 35 years of college teaching. This is the Calumet College of St. Joseph, where I, I enrolled because there were so many wonderful people from, I think, that order, like um, Michelle Dvorak, the dean. 
anyway, yeah. um, uh, I miss that community. They hosted a wonderful environmental task force for the Calumet River up east of Chicago, where the dirty steel mill pollution still is. Um, but I, I do get hope from from knowing you all are there and aware of these problems, and I do believe there's a higher reality that we can mm. join with, even when we can hardly breathe. That's even. right. And Sarah, we're a collective. <laughs> we're a collective here, and we're breathing with you. We're sending love to you, heart energy. We're in a cardia sphere as well as a noosphere. We're sending you love. Mm. Katie? Yes, in our group, a um, couple of us mentioned working locally mm. and doing what we can, you know, locally to protect our environment. And of course, that's all aspects of the water, the air, the forest. Mm. Um, and I've just moved to Hamtramck, Michigan, and I joined a group. And uh, the city of Detroit and the state of Michigan approved an incinerator. And now I believe that our pollution in, in uh, Detroit is probably one of the worst in the country. And our group has just sued the state of Michigan. So wow. when you work locally, right. you, got, you need a good lawyer. <laughs> and right. you know, for me, that's hope. Yeah. Because it's saying work locally, work on a problem, and bring in the lawyers. Yeah. And we don't know what will happen, of course, because they gave permission for this incinerator to be mm. built in mm. the city of Detroit. Mm. So to be continued. Great but news. Powerful news. Yes. Good. So now um, we'll just, um, I don't think anybody else has got their hand up. We'll just move on to, we'll be moving towards conclusion. I'll just share the screen one more time. So that's, this is, we're really at the point where I'm really saying, let's open this up a little bit more to share our reflections or any questions that you might have. And then I've got a song to finish with that we can come back to. So just to let you know that we're doing well time-wise. So um, stop this here. We're doing really well. Um, Bob and Penny and Gail and I had a practice at six o'clock yesterday morning. And one of the promises I made was that I'd time it so that we wouldn't go over time. And now we've got, we're under time. So <laughs> if anybody would like to ask a question or make a reflection, just put your hand up. Um, so we've got, I'm assuming Sarah, you've, haven't got another question but Damien you have so would you like to share your your reflection Damien I, I just want to follow up briefly on what the first respondents uh, mentioned quantum physics uh, I've also been I guess allured by quantum physics and even though it's complicated for me uh, it gives me hope because it talks about our interconnectivity yeah. so it seems like uh, modern physics and spirituality are coming together which is very hopeful and also there is a study in, in, in science and spirituality that if a certain number of people are evolving uh I forget what it is, 10%, you know, mm -hmm. it, it has a profound effect on the transformation of society. Um, right. So I'm sure other people have heard of that and there's a name mm -hmm. for it, but it's a scientific study about mm -hmm. the change, you know, the profound transformation can take place by a few individuals yes. making yes. these important changes in evolution. Yeah. Thanks, Damien. Let's just let that one drop into the group for a minute. It only needs a small number of people to actively and consciously be aware that we are a collective, that we yes. are and can make a difference. It, it sounds like the hundredth monkey. Yes, that's yeah. it. That's yes. it. Yes. 
Okay, yeah. let's go. Thank you. Let's go to Tarkum now. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon or evening. Yeah. Um, I think what I've taken away from today is the sense of recognising that change will happen mm -hmm. and that I and the people that I love and live with in my communities will need spiritual and emotional preparedness. And the first section of today in our breakout group, I thought of the earth as becoming on a whim, becoming dispossessed uh, in its own way and um, going through its own death. And if we were with someone else who was in the throes of such pain, we, as a person, uh, we would treat it very differently. So I'm still preparing for the future. Uh, the earth mirrors my own journey. And so while we wait, and struggle and feel grief and anger, I think um, for me it's very important to also nourish the earth in as many ways as we can and nourish each other. Mm. Thanks, Tarquin. And that's exactly what um, Carolyn Baker says, Tarquin, in her book, Collapsing Consciously. It's such an important time for us to be aware of doing this because it, it is important to actively hope and um, believe in ourselves that we can make a difference. Thank you. Carmen? Um, yeah, I'd like to uh, share a little poem that um, I wrote about Indra's net. It's a metaphor about um, a, a, a net, a three-dimensional net, and where the points meet is a, a multifaceted jewel that reflects all the others. And so I think of us as, as Indra's net, and in this net here of the internet that, that we're on right now with this program, we're, um, we're shining our light and also we can pull a little bit in one direction and, and make a make and it'll have effect on the larger um, group. So there's a little so, uh, melody I came up with and I put it in. Uh, I put the words in the chat, but uh, it's very simple. Points of light in Indra's net, receive and send, communicate. I'll do it three times. Points of light in Indra's net, receive and send, communicate. Points of light in Indra's net, receive and send, communicate. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Ellen. Yes, I'm really so happy. I heard two people uh, mention quantum physics and um, usually that doesn't happen in groups. And so in addition to what I think your name is uh, Damien who talked about the, the connectiveness that he likes about that. And I like that. And the other thing that I really like about quantum physics is that um, it, it upturned all the thinking that existed up till then. And before quantum physics came along, people pretty much thought that everything was settled. You know, we figured out this force and that force and we knew what it was about. And I just love the idea that uh, there are forces um, in the world which cannot be figured out and cannot necessarily be predicted. And uh, because in, in modernity, I think one of the, the big likes is that everything is certain, everything is straight and square and certain. And I think uncertainty is just wonderful. And that gives me hope. Thanks, Ellen. Thank you. Thank you. Victoria. Um, I, I want to really thank you, um, Margie, for the quote at the beginning that was in the film. It's really staying with me in a very very deep profound way that to know me is to breathe with me yeah yeah and to breathe with me is to listen deeply 
And um, I, I'm really keep being pulled, lured back to that. And I'm thinking, you know, um, when I get uh, read news or get a text from my brother who's in a political quagmire of mess that triggers me, <laughs> um, or anything that just pulls me into feeling um, hopeless or frustrated or angry, I think what I want to do is breathe with that person or that mm. situation mm. instead of um, allowing any reaction to go forward. I want to just breathe and be with them, even if they don't know I'm being with them. Mm. And I just want to respond to the quantum field that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Beautiful. Because um, as I mentioned in our breakout group, um, Another thing I love about quantum physics is that they say that the, that reality is more dreamlike than matter-like. Mm -hmm. And so I've been pursuing this idea of becoming a quantum lucid dreamer. <laughs> and so uh, if I can tame my own reactivity or frustration in the face of some of these situations and do this, this practice of breathing with the person or breathing with the situation and feeling like in my being I'm doing deep listening with them instead mm. of reacting I feel like maybe that can also go into the quantum field and yeah. fuel the dream of interconnection yep yes yeah. definitely definitely thank you Victoria and um we've got time for one more so Albert would you be willing to share with us yours now Yes. Well, I just, I don't know whether anybody here is familiar um, with uh, David Bohm's Conscious Universe, Infinite Potential. Yeah. Um, I put that in the uh, chat, um, but it's an incredible film. And um, he's a scientist uh, who develop his, his development and Stuff has been incredible, and I just say, if you want a, a look at how he makes quantum physics and all of that stuff into spirituality, yeah. um, it's a, it's a great journey. Good. Thank thank you, Albert, and also just to be aware that what we're doing here is very simply allowing what is to emerge to emerge. And that's what David Boehm is also teaching us, the importance of emergent dialogue. So let's just move to our last song before we finish. Sorry. Fears. 
Let the wind blow into your life Such faith and trust Oh, let the earth hold you Take care of you And nurture you Oh, the power of love is here now The power of now is here now The power of you means here to create Magic on us The power of love is here now The power of now is here now The power of you me is here to create Magic on us great little song that I was allured to and I think it's true isn't it the power of love is flowing now the power of now is here now and with this in this moment I would like to declare that I'm completing and concluding this presentation ah thank you Margie so much thank you Margie thank you. so much thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you much. Thank Margie. you so much, Margie. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Margie. Thank you. What a beautiful song to end on. Oh, my thank you. Thank, thank you. you all for beautiful. sharing. Beautiful. Wish you many thank you. <laughs> thank you. So you, you. You may want to put yourself thank back you, in the gallery view at this point. But what? You may want to put yourself back in gallery view so that we can all see each other. Yes, that's beautiful. Well, I stay for the mingle time. That would be great. And uh, yes, I'll stop the recording and we can.